Welcome to K9 Revolution Radio. Presented by K9 Revolution Dog Training, enhancing the dog and owner relationship through education, balance, and pack instinct. Hey everybody, Chad here with another episode of Canine Revolution Radio. We got Kevin and Chris today, as, as usual, and uh, I got one arm. So, today we're going to be talking about... Are you, are you going to elaborate? Specs. What happened to your arm? Well, what happened was uh, my buddies here, Chris and Kevin, went and helped me pick up a treadmill. I was not even in there. And yet. I ripped my bicep. <laughs> I was literally right next to you. All you had to do was ask for help. Anyway, we're good to go. All right, no issues. On the path to recovery. Major issues. And uh, the only issue is I can't go to the gym right now, so. <laughs> that is an issue, because he's all pent up. Can't double fist Oreos anymore. Yeah, he's got too much energy. <laughs> oh we're constantly having to tell him, come All right, down. stay focused, stay focused. So today's, today's episode, we're talking about training progressions. And what we're going to talk about today is our standard common progression that we use for, for us, our basic and advanced training programs. However, you got to keep in mind, whatever your goal is with your dog, you need to break up that goal into what we call baby steps or use successive approximation and uh, teach it to your dog in a way that's going to be very conducive to their understanding. It's an onion. It's an onion layer. That's right. It's an onion layer. You got to peel it back very slowly, right? And so build it up the way that the dog understands, right? And progress your training, uh, you know, systematically, not too quickly, not too slowly, but systematically to keep moving your dog forward towards your goal. You know what I'm saying? So, don't get into the trap of getting it stuck on one step in the progression, which a lot of people do. You know, how many people do we see where, you know, we go to their house and they're showing us that they've taught their dog how to sit, but every time they teach their dog, every time they get the dog to sit, it always has to be with a, with a treat. Right. It always has to be with a certain hand motion. It always has to be in a certain location of the house. You know, if they're not, if they're outside the house, they won't sit. They I have to have a treat for them to sit. You know what I'm saying? So how do we progress from that? to the finished product where they're going to sit no matter what's going on, uh, no matter where you're at, you know what I'm saying? So, and it doesn't just go for basic stuff like sitting. It goes for like, you know, aggressive behaviors that we're trying to rehabilitate it goes for insecure behaviors that we're trying to rehabilitate could go for like sport work. If you're competing in dog sports, you know what I'm saying? How are you going to progress to a fine, uh, finished behavior that you need in that sport? You know what I'm saying? If you're training your weight training, you know, how do you progress to make your biceps stronger so they don't tear? You know what I'm saying? <laughs> I don't know. Tell us. <laughs> Obviously, I failed in that regard. So, uh, so anyway, you know, as with everything, you know, it needs to be systematic. It needs to be fair, you know, progression. But you always got to be pushing forward, pushing forward, pushing forward. Of course, as you're progressing, there's going to be times where you need to step back in your progression. Take a few steps back. Hash something out. Move back forward. You know what I'm saying? So, uh, you know, like they say, slow and steady wins the race. So be consistent with your routine and ritual. Peel back the onion layer. Ring the ding dong. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> All bang, those bang. good things. Bang, bang, bang. Boom, boom, boom. And then work on your progression slowly forward to meet your goal, whatever that goal is. But today, our progression would get like if you follow this progression with your dog. Right. First of all, you need to have an understanding of each step of the progression, which we're going to talk through. But then to get to your finalized product, you know, like if you talk through this, this if you go through this progression, like with, with the way we do it, you're going to have very precise obedience. You're going to have adherence and any distraction, you know what I'm saying? And it's going to help you rehabilitate serious behavioral problems. Right. Anything to add, guys, before we get into it? Rock and roll. Yep. That was five star intro, boys. Uh, good to go. So the first thing we need to do, number one. What do we need to do? Condition our verbal markers, right? So this is going to help us communicate to our dog, pinpoint a moment in time to our dog when they're doing something right or wrong, and then be able to provide some type of reinforcement after uh, we pinpoint that moment in time to them, right? So we've got three verbal markers that we condition, and we're going to do this with a food reward. Um, but the first one's going to be yes, the word yes. And if we say yes, to our dog, that means they have done something correctly. They are to move to us for a food reward, right? The second marker would be good, is what we call our duration marker. So if we say good to our dog, they have done the right thing. They are to remain in place. We will step forward, move to them. We will deliver a reward to them 
while they maintain whatever behavior that we're marking, right? So that could be a sit, could be healing, anything like that, okay? Then we do have an accountability marker, the word no. That means that the dog has disobeyed us, done something wrong, broken our expectation, and that uh, they should fix themselves or we're going to hold them accountable. Does that kind of make sense? Good to go on that? Good to go. All right, so just to break that down a little bit further, the way we're going to condition these markers, and this is going to take hundreds and hundreds of repetitions, basically what we do, take the dog out to one of our training areas or out in your yard, have the dog on a six-foot leash, walk around with it. Anytime that dog shows eye contact to you, right, they're just going to make their own decision to make eye contact on you. You say yes, you back up very quickly to induce the dog to move to you, and then you drop your hand, whatever hand has the food reward in it, and they should be able to come to that hand and take a food reward, right? So hundreds of repetitions of that. The dog's going to understand that when you say yes, they're going to move to you, take a food reward, right? The word good, just like whenever we have that finished, we're going to say good, move to our dog, deliver a reward to them. So again, we'll be out in our training area. All the dog has to do is just, you know, show us some sort of behavior we're looking for, such as eye contact. Once that dog looks in our direction, we say good, step forward to them, hand them a food reward right to their nose. Good to go, right? And then the word no, later on, once the dog is getting some behavior shaped, what we're going to do, let's say we, we've shaped the uh, sit position with that dog. Whenever we say sit, if the dog does not sit, all we're going to do is say no, move the food reward behind our back, and wait for that dog to sit. Once they sit, then we bring it back out, good or yes, and then have them get the reward, right? So, again, you have to do that repetitiously in order to condition those verbal markers. But it's very important that we first establish a communication system with the dog to where they understand what we're saying at different points in time. Right? Good to go? Good. Chris? Yeah. I mean, uh, I don't know. So, timing would be definitely important here. Is this something? Am I jumping ahead? Are you good? Okay. Uh, some, you know, I didn't get a script, so yeah, you don't need a script. <laughs> but yeah, timing. When we're talking about uh, marking behavior, timing is very important. So we always say consistency and timing, um, and we've talked about this before in previous podcasts. But uh, let's say we are training a sit, for example, and you know, and our dog's butt hits the ground. That is the moment you want to mark that behavior and deliver your reward, right? We don't want to wait till that butt hits the ground. We deliver it, then we're stumbling. We take thirty seconds to get our food reward, and their butt's already come up off the ground, and now our, our timing is off, and you're never going to achieve that communication communication system unless you're consistent and your timing is good good to go all right <clears throat> the next thing we want to do is build engagement and focus so engagement is a dog building sustained focus on the handler despite what's going on around them right so if you ever see someone or if you ever see one of our videos we take a dog out to a training area or out to a distraction area and uh, that dog is looking at us, making very strong eye contact with us, that is, that is engagement. That's what it looks like. And the reason why engagement's important, why it's number two in the progression, is because we need engagement in order to teach our dog more precise behaviors or more desirable behaviors, right? If our dog's not wanting to focus on us, not wanting to pay attention to us, it's going to be very difficult, next to impossible, to effectively teach that dog what they need to know, right? And you're going to see dogs out there with trainers that they're actively avoiding that trainer, right? So that trainer's not establishing engagement. This is not something that a lot of people do, unfortunately, right? But for us, it's critical. It's the backbone of our progression. And uh, there are going to be certain times in, within the progression that we go back and do more engagement work, no matter what step of the progression we're on, just to keep that very strong as throughout our entire progression process, but also the life of the dog, you know? There's nothing better than taking your dog out to distraction. Your dog's walking nicely on a loose leash next to you. Dogs and people are, you know, not people, but dogs are lunging at your dog, snarling well, at it. Sometimes people, people will people lunge at you. People are doing that, trying to pet your dog. Your dog is just hanging out with you, doesn't care about all these distractions. They're doing what you want them to do, and that's a result of good engagement, right? So the key here is, you know, number one, when you're building up your engagement, you know, the dog knows your communication system. And then number two you build up what are called reinfor uh, reward, reward events. And a reward event is simply an interaction between the dog and handler that both find uh, enjoyable, both find uh, exciting, right? Make sure Lexi was uh, Lexi, on that? point with that yeah. one. All right, Lexi, one of our apprentices, you know, <laughs> she, she hammered that out, that terminology out pretty good. So, <laughs> so reward events, right? Very, very important, 
right? We definitely need to, uh, Ben, put this on a note. We need to have a video on developing reward events if we don't have one already on our YouTube so people can see that. Probably with Lexi since she's the reward event expert, right? Mm -hmm. So, uh, again, reward events, very important. It's that interaction between you and your dog that you both find enjoyable, that you both find exciting. So, for example, we take a dog out to our training area. We They either look at us on their own or we can say their name. As soon as they make eye contact with us, we say yes. We run backward. They're chasing us to get the food or the toy out of our hand. Uh, all of a sudden, we run a different direction. So now they're playing a game of chase real quick, you know, instigating some prey drive. Very fun for the dog. Very engaging. And then we deliver a reward to them, right? So that it's more about the interaction with you than, than the reward itself that's building up that engagement and that focus, right? And you'll see a dog that has multiple handlers, different people working that dog in the same situation, but that dog is definitely tuned into more to one of those handlers than the other. And wh why is that? It's because that one handler has spent more time building up reward events, building up engagement with the dog than the others. Sure, the dog might perform for that for the other people, but it's not going to perform the same as it would with that one handler that uh, does more engagement, right? More engagement work, more focus building work has developed their reward events uh, than the other handlers. You know what I'm saying? You guys have anything to add to that? That's number two of our progression. Yeah, yeah I mean, it's just, uh, you know, we use it all the way through. It pays off in distraction work. You know, yep. it makes it very, very motivating, you know, get the dog to work for us. Yeah. And obviously we want to expand on those levels of motivation. So ultimately when we ask our dog to do something, we want them to want to do it, you yep. know? So utilizing engagement, uh, definitely why we do it so early on is so important to, to, to the process as a whole. Yeah. And the other thing too is like, you know, at certain points in training and in rehabilitation, a dog is going to get stressed by something, you know, could be stressed out by like a trash truck dumping a dumpster. Yep. Could be stressed out by the amount of people that are at a farmer's market. Or right? a pole. Or a pole. <laughs> <laughs> that too. So like with that being said, you can use engagement once you've laid your foundation in your normal training area. Like Kevin said, when you go out to distraction, if your dog's a little bit stressed out, you can jump into an engagement session with your dog to number one, de-escalate their level of stress and then just continue to develop that dog's confidence and focus on you which is going to help everything in the long run in your progression you know what i'm saying so good to go all right step number three in our training progression is going to be working on leash pressure right so leash pressure uh, leash pressure work is going to be essentially desensitizing the dog's opposition reflex uh, when applied via the leash on the dog's neck. So what is opposition reflex? Uh, in, a, in the situation of a dog, it's when you put tension on a dog, like with a leash and collar, and the dog pulls against the leash, right? So let's say you got a puppy, put a slip lead on it, slip lead gets tight because the puppy's just walking around, puppy feels that tightness, they're pulling hard against you, away from you, right? That's opposition reflex, that's natural in all mammals, right? If I were to push Chris right now, his natural tendency would be to provide opposition to my force of pushing him, right? I can only do it to Chris because this arm is immobile, so you know what I'm it saying? It looked like you were moving him there for a second. He's, like, going with it. Well, he's conditioned. He's, he's condition done the pressure too. work with me, and so now I, I go with it. So, But opposition reflex, right? Leash pressure. So, like, let's say we put a leash on a dog. Their natural tendency is to pull against the leash, against what we're doing. So we want to desensitize that. How are we going to do that? Well, we can do it, number one, because we've already conditioned our verbal markers so the dog knows our communication. And then number two, we've established engagement so our dog wants to learn from us. So all we do is we put our training collar on the dog, which could be like a choke chain, pinch collar, martingale collar. It could be a flat collar. It could be a slip lead. It literally doesn't matter. Whatever training collar you decide to use, put a leash on the training collar. You pull gently. Gently you pull on your collar in one direction, right? Could be behind the dog. Could be in front of the dog. And you wait, gentle pulling. You want very light tension on the dog. Your dog's probably going to resist that tension for a minute. And the second that they show any behavior or any inkling to give in to that tension, you say yes, right? Because we've already conditioned that verbal marker. You back up. You go into a reward event, which is what we've already talked about, and reward that dog for giving in to that pressure just slightly. And you repeat that repetitiously hundreds and hundreds of times, and you build up that response to where you gently pull into the leash and the dog is instantly moving in the direction of the leash and walking very nicely in the direction of the leash, right? 
So that is what we call leash pressure work. That's desensitizing the dog's opposition reflex when it comes with the leash. Does that kind of make sense? Now of note, we do this with training collars on the dog's neck. When it comes to harnesses, we generally like to maintain opposition reflex with the harness. And the reason for that is we can use the harness later in specialty work. Like let's talk about a protection dog. Like we want tension on the harness. We want the dog to be pulling against the tension on the harness for a variety of reasons and protection work. So when it comes to training, we're going to desensitize opposition reflex in regards to a leash and collar. We're going to maintain opposition reflex and even promote it, build it up when it comes to a, to harness work, right? In most cases, obviously if there's a service dog that needs a harness for whatever reason, we may desensitize it in that case, you know what I'm saying? And we'll do that later once we get to that stage in training. But in general, we're going to desensitize leash pressure when it comes to leash and collar, maintain leash pressure when it comes to harnesses. Does that kind of make sense? Mm -hmm. Good to go. All right. Step number four in our training progression is going to be shaping and developing the muscle memory re required for obedience behaviors. So let's talk about shaping. What is shaping? Shaping is simply dog training terminology for creating behavior, right? So whenever we say shape behavior, we're talking about creating a behavior. All the behaviors that a dog does for us, sitting, downing, staying, coming when called, walking nicely on a leash, sitting at a door, guess what? Those are not genetic behaviors in your dog those behaviors have to be shaped those behaviors have to be created right so step number four in our progression is developing the muscle memory needed for obedience behaviors why do we have to develop muscle memory you ask well the, the reason for that is the dog is a nonverbal being right that doesn't reason like a human does we have to clearly communicate to them and teach them in black and white what we expect their body's not used to sitting right? When we say sit, their body doesn't know how to move into a down. We say down. That is all stuff that we have to teach them. That's all stuff we have to shape. Does that kind of make sense? So in this step, basically we're using a food lure and a lure is just using food in our hand to move the dog's body around. So we'll put food in our hand, show it to the dog's nose. The dog will start to follow the food in your hand because of hunger drive. And then we'll manipulate their body into different positions by moving our hand up or down, for example, we move our hand up, they're going to sit. We move our hand down towards the ground, they're going to down, right? Some of this is easier in some dogs than others. Am I right? Mm -hmm. Right? Some dogs, this is a challenge. Chris is our small dog specialist, so he's often on the ground a lot of times with these little Yorkies he's training. And in the chiropractor's <laughs> office a lot. I, say, I thought he was just in pain when I saw him. Shout out that. to Doc Anthony. Thanks for keeping Chris healthy and in check, you know? <laughs> but, uh, you know, you're going to have to lure and lure. show these dogs these different positions, how to manipulate, how to move their body, how to get comfortable doing this. And that's what this step of the progression is for. Now, once your dog becomes fluent in this and your lures become very easy, the dog's laying down very easily, they're sitting very easily, they're coming when called very easily, then we can progress into the next step, right? But your focus on step number four in our progression, developing the muscle memory, is just showing that dog, hey, these positions that we're, we're showing you, you're, you're going to move your body into, right? No big deal. Nothing wrong with that, right? Just new behaviors we're learning. Just like when, uh, you know, I don't know an example, but like a kid riding a bicycle, right? That's something that the parents have to teach the kid, you know, and you got the training wheels and you take the training wheels off. The parents running with the child, you know, keeping them stable. Same thing, right? You're just teaching that child how to move on that bike. Same thing with the dog. You're teaching the dog how to lay down, teaching the dog how to sit, so on and so forth, right? Good to go. Good. I'd say repetitions are your friend here. Repetitions um, are your you friend. You know, I see a lot of times, well, I guess I see, I'll see two sides. Either somebody will get stuck in this phase or yeah. uh, there not enough repetitions are done. A lot of times mm -hmm. you get a sit or two and like, a boom, got to, you know, good to go on a yeah. sit. I took a puppy class or whatever. We got a couple sits out. Yeah. Rep this takes a lot of repetitions to, Thousands to build of repetitions. this muscle memory. Yep. And that's, a, that's what you just said is the key is like people are getting, uh, they want it now. Yep. They want it quick. Mm -hmm. Right. That's the issue with uh, culture these days mm -hmm. is you want things too quickly. Yeah. You cannot rush this process with your dog. It makes it way better in the long run if you just crank out your repetitions. I would say this is one of the most important steps when you're talking about obedience work because just like getting that dog comfortable with that position, right, with your lures, critical, you know. But then like you said, Chris, people get stuck at this phase. Mm -hmm. They don't know how yep. to get out of this phase. 
there's going to be several ways that you get out of this phase by fading, right? Fading is the elimination of help in, in uh, your training, but you're going to fade your lures, right? You're going to might use the leash to help you out, right? So you're going to have to use different methods with your dog. And this is where experience comes in. This is why, you know, organizations like ours exist because we have the experience with so many dogs that we can, we can uh, easily troubleshoot what does this dog need to help them fade away these lures and get out of this, uh, you know, muscle memory phase, right? And uh, proceed from there, okay? But step number five in our progression, the next step is when we're going to put these obedience behaviors on cue or on command, verbal cue, right? Believe it or not, verbal commands are harder for a dog to maintain than physical commands, right? So people are always thinking that hand signals are cool. They are cool, right? Very cool when you give a hand signal, your dog does that. That's actually very easy for your dog to interpret. It's more difficult for your dog to be conditioned to a verbal cue and maintain that conditioning, right? So basically in this step of, of the progression, step number five, we're going to be saying our command such as sit and then luring the dog we're going to say the command we're going to pause and then we're going to lure the dog into a sit because they're already familiar with that muscle memory and what is that doing that's uh classically conditioning that command or that cue for that specific behavior set does that kind of make sense and then we're going to fade the lure as we go through repetitions of this we're going to fade the lure and then we're going to start to use the leash to help us into because uh, we've already done the leash pressure work we're going to use the leash to help us fade out that lure, maintain the, uh, maintain the behavior, right? The other thing we're going to do at this stage in training, adjust the dog's reinforcement schedule. So there's three reinforcement schedules we're going to use in training, which uh, reinforcement schedule is just, you know, how often that dog's getting rewarded. So at the first part of training, they're going to get continuous reinforcement, which means we reward every single repetition of behavior, right? Every single time they sit, we say good, we reward, or we say yes, we reward, right? Uh, the next reinforcement schedule is interval reinforcement, which means every couple repetitions they're going to get a reward, not every time. Then the third type of reinforcement schedule is going to be a random reinforcement schedule where you as the handler, the trainer, the owner dictate when you're getting a reward, giving a reward to your dog, which means your dog's basically playing the lottery, you know what I'm saying, for you. And this is the, this is the reinforcement schedule you're going to end up on in a maintenance phase of training. And it's also how you're going to just continue maintaining your, your different behaviors with your dog and continue your engagement work and all that kind of stuff, right? So your dog's playing the lottery for you. Does that kind of make sense? So in step number five, when we're assigning cues and commands, as the dog becomes more familiar and more conditioned to those commands and those cues, this is when we're going to be uh, changing up that dog's reinforcement schedule. Okay, good to go. Yeah. So take note too how it's kind of broken down. We don't start saying these commands like sit and down and stay during that luring phase. When we're building right. the muscle memory, we're not saying those commands, right? So if you're you're saying those words when the dog has no understanding of that, you can you can make that word meaningless if you if you do that repetitiously, right? So notice we're doing the luring phase first, the luring, mm -hmm. and then Lur we add, then we then we put the command on it. So that's another that's another one where I see a lot of people kind of skip some steps and, and right. jump ahead. Right. Don't jump ahead. Patience is key. Kevin? Hmm. I was just thinking if I could say lure. There we go. Yeah. Lure. Yeah. Just stay, stick with what lure. you got. You already got the apprentices saying lure. Lure. <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of like the signature move around here. Now. Again, we are based in South Carolina. For those of you that do not know, South I was born here. Lackey. So lure. <laughs> lure All right. Around. Step number six in our progression is going to be introducing uh, some corrections for disobedience. And the first way we're going to apply this is with some constant pressure, which is going to be removed when the behavior is performed. So let's say we ask the dog to sit. They're not sitting. At this point, we've gone through all steps of our progression, right? We say no. If they don't sit, we apply gentle pressure on the leash in an upward direction. Why do we do that? Because leash pressure now communicates to the dog to move in that direction. So if we gently pull upward, that should signal the dog's head to move up, which is going to signal to the dog's uh, bottom to move down towards the ground right and then uh, the dog oh, should sit yeah, got amped about that one <laughs> as soon <laughs> as soon as the dog sits what do we do we drop all pressure good reward does that kind of make sense so that's how we're going to first introduce a correction then step number seven is we're going to introduce uh corrections with like a standard 
what you would call leash correction in dog training world, which would be just a snap and release of the leash. So you say sit, the dog doesn't sit, you say no, snap and release of the leash, dog sits, you say good, good to go, right? So that's how we're going to introduce leash corrections. And then, uh, and that's going to be able to allow us to teach the dog accountability. Because remember, the, the reason that we give corrections for dogs, number one, is to change a dog's behavior. But number two, for that dog's safety, hmm. right? If, your dog, if, you're on, if you live in uh, like a neighborhood and your dog runs out your front door towards the street, there's cars coming, and you say come, right? And your dog has never been held accountable for any behavior, period. Your dog's like, I don't want to come right now. I'm running towards the street. Yeah. Doing what I want to do. Right, doing what I want to do. Why should I? (laughs) I want to get that squirrel over there. Right. But if you've held your dog accountable, your dog knows that there is a consequence for not listening. So in that case, like, oop, you know, I'm going to turn around and go back to what I'm supposed to be doing. Right? So that's why accountability is very important for our dog's safety. Okay? It's all a balance, you know. Exactly. It's got to be balanced in our communication system. When you start to implement, uh, you know, when you get to the correction phase, your dog needs to have clear expectations of what you're asking them. So day one, you can't just go out there and start going crazy on them with a leash and expect them to know. Mm -hmm. You know, you could even, you know, shut your dog down at that point or other other bad things could arise from that. Mm -hmm. So it's very important when you implement corrections that not only they know the expectations, but you know what you're doing uh, when you administer them. You have in your brain your expectation for the dog. You know what I'm saying? You can't can't change your expectation. It's got to be a consistent expectation. You can't say sit one day and be okay with them just sitting. Yeah, and then the next day you're like, well, you have to sit in this certain position mm-hmm. in relation to me. Like, that's not fair. Right. You know what I'm saying? So you got to keep your expectations very clear, very concise, right, throughout the whole process. Uh, consistency in the dog world is, like, huge. Yeah. You know, it's one thing that they rely on, one thing we rely on, you know, in our day-to-day. Yeah. You know, so just just be mindful of that. It'll teach us a little bit as a human, too. Mm-hmm. Slow down. Be get consistent. Get some patience in yeah, there, you know. Have some patience. <laughs> have some rituals and routines day in and day out good to go right all right the next step in our training progression step number eight is going to be remote collar conditioning so all the dogs that go through our programs we do condition a remote collar uh, with them because that's a safety factor if that owner is going to be doing any type of distance work with their dog or any type of off-leash work with their dog we're going to be uh, uh, recommending a remote collar for them to serve as your invisible leash which ensures the safety of your dog right so we have a whole process to conditioning a remote collar. I believe we've already covered it in our remote collar podcast. So you have to go back and listen to that for a detailed analysis of how we condition the remote collar. Um, but this is a very important piece uh, to training your dog, especially if you got your dog's safety as number one in your mind. But also, this can be messed up very easily. It takes some experience to really become confident in remote collar conditioning. And it's going to vary from dog to dog just a little bit. You know what I'm saying? So go back and listen to that episode about remote collar work. That way uh, you can hear the full discussion on that and also some common myths that we debunked on that podcast. Right? Because so that is collar, everybody tunes out. Right. That's so, a hot topic right. in the dog training community, but it does need to be discussed. Proper information needs to be given out there. Episode 19. Go back, listen to episode 19 about remote collar work. Okay. But step number eight in our, uh, our progression is remote collar conditioning. Step number nine is remote collar application. When conditioning is complete, now we're going to start teaching that dog that it applies to every area of training that we're doing, right? And again, that's for your dog's safety, okay? Once we finish remote collar conditioning and application, then step number 10 is going to be where we uh, practice and prepare the dog for off-leash training, right? This is for, for us, we have an a off-leash training program and an on-leash program. So anybody that's going through our off-leash program, their dog is going to be getting this specialized off-leash preparatory work to prepare them for what we call the off-leash test when we certify that dog is good to go off-leash, right? All right, step number 11 in our progression is going to be tuning in and precising our vehicle and home protocols. How many times have we seen a dog, talked to someone with a dog, picked up a dog from them for training, this dog's just losing it in the car? Super anxious, super insecure. I'll never forget. One of the first dogs I trained in South Carolina when I moved back here. I'm not going to say the dog's name. Hopefully they're listening. Someone that goes to Dog and Duck all the time. We've seen them there. You know what I'm talking about? (laughs) I know exactly who (laughs) But I picked up the first dog we trained for him, and this dog 
blue anals in my truck, no. diarrhea in my truck, threw up in my truck, screaming in my truck the whole time. <laughs> Immediately had to take my truck to the detailer. It was so bad. That's how bad that dog's anxiety was in the vehicle. And then through the training process, taught that dog the vehicle is nothing to freak out about. You remain calm, right? And one way we're going to do that is teach the dog just to lay down in the back seat and just chill out while the vehicle's in motion, right? So vehicle and home protocols, that's a whole section of our progression because we're going to make that stuff very precise. How to move in and out of doors, how to behave in the house in like a spot command or a place command, right? How to behave around countertops. We got a lot of dogs that know in their past, they're conditioned to jump on counters, right? We got to we gotta teach them that's no longer acceptable. Doorbells. Right? Doorbells, jumping on people that are walking in, all that kind of stuff. We're going to precision that out, right? So that's that step in our training progression. We're focusing on that stuff. Then the other thing, too, is for that, especially in the house, that spot command, we have to teach that dog that you may be on spot for a very extended period of time. Guess what? That dog's going to get bored. That dog's never been to that level of boredom before. So getting to them to that level of boredom and extending past that, teaching them that, hey, even if you're bored, you're going to have to stay here mm -hmm. until your mom or dad says it's okay to get up. That's very important, very critical part of training, right? So we're going to be hashing that out. Step number 11 of our progression, vehicle and home protocols. Chris, you had something to add? No. Just scratching my nose. Looked like you had something to add. No. All right. No. All right. Uh, step number 12 in our progression is where we focus on socialization work. So socialization is providing the dog with positive experiences and close proximity to new people, places, and things. Going to be taking the dog to various places, performing some engagement, doing some reward events, helping that dog to have a very good experience wherever it goes, mm -hmm. right? And this is going to apply for uh, grooming, handling, vet handling, all the above, getting used to those types of uh, situations and uh, scenarios, right? Um, we do have a podcast episode on this as well. Um, so you can look that up, that deep dives into socialization, how we do it, what to be looking for, what should you be thinking about, right? We also have, it's episode three of our podcast. And then also we have a couple YouTube videos that are demonstrating this. Um, and if you're one of our alumni, if you're part of our alumni portal on the website, if you've signed up for that, we have a full video that details a couple of our socialization sessions um, where basically Ben's just following us around. And uh, we're, we're talking through what, why are we doing this in a socialization session? What, what are we looking for, right? So that's very important for any dog, for the life of the dog, socialization work, which we focus on number 12 in our uh, training progression, okay? And then number 13 in our progression is where, is where we're going to actually do the off-leash tests, just proof everything off-leash, run the dog through various scenarios, make sure that they're responding appropriately off-leash in a safe environment, and then progressing that up from there. Okay. Step number 14 in our progression is what we call distraction work. And this is where we generalize all training in a variety of locations and we proof all obedience in all locations. So this is where we take the dogs to parks, uh, water parks, uh, splash pads, uh, the beach, the pool. Well, you're, you can't well, go to the beach. It's summertime. It's summertime. Dog but, and uh, ducks. Dog and dog ducks. And duck. Restaurants. Farmers Pizza markets. CC Swift. You can't take them to CC. That's, that's for us, socialization. <laughs> <laughs> but you get the idea. You know, Lowe's, Home Depot, you get the idea. We're taking the tractor supply. Good place. Oh, oh yeah. Tractor One supply. of my favorites. Food, food, truck, food truck, truck, festival. truck festival. Can't beat it, you know. And Page's Oak Grill. Good to go. Mm. Bad daddy. Mm. Fuji. Get a little hunger. <laughs> <laughs> what are you guys right, doing for dinner? So, uh, so anyway, distraction work. You're taking your dog out to a bunch of different places. You're proofing your obedience work right? You're generalizing your training. That way your dog understands no matter where you go, your expectation remains the same and their behavior should be the same, whatever you request of them. Okay. I don't know how many times I've gone somewhere. People's they're getting drag, drug around by their dog. Their dog's barking at everything, you know, growling at everything, lunging at everything. You know, if it sees somebody it has to run over to them. If it sees a dog, it has to run over to them. You know, your dog should be chilling, hanging out with you, very obedient to what you ask them to do, maintaining a calm, confident, relaxed mindset, no matter what's going on around you, right? So that's the purpose of distraction work, right? Anything to add? As good. you can tell, Kevin, uh, he really likes the food distraction situations. <laughs> Actually, you did a whole podcast on places to go with your dog for food, <laughs> didn't you? 
It's a, yeah, we time for an update. We need to update the list. You know, Dave. Dave wants an updated list. He's been asking for it. Dave. Dave's fancy now. He likes to go downtown. He likes going downtown. Downtown yeah. Somerville. Yep. Go. He does like it. Dave, if Off you're listening. Chain sandwich up. What? What? Off the, chain? <laughs> Off the chain. Off the chain's very good. Uh, but uh, Dave, if you're listening, we'll get a new episode going for you here pretty soon, buddy. All right. <laughs> And then our, our last couple steps to our training progression for us, just because, you know, we're training dogs uh, for people, for families, right? Our last couple steps are going to be training the owners, right? That's good. For us, it's going to be taking that dog home, getting that, uh, those owners prepared to transition that dog home, preparing them for that with also training update videos twice a week throughout their entire time their dog's with us, and a training handbook that details everything their dog did in training. The return session is going to be about one to two hours of training at their house because sometimes we're taking longer. sometimes longer, four hours, five hours, as long know. as it takes. That's right. As long as it takes for us to get the job done. You know, twenty-four hours. I've stayed the night at a couple. I've had requests yeah. multiple what? times. What? Yeah, just stay here. Yeah, I've <laughs> had that too. I'm like, well, if you got weights and food, I'm good. <laughs> you know, you feed us, give us a room, good yep. to go. That's I mean, all. High value reward goes, you know, yeah, a long way with us. Box as of well. pizza, Both you ways. got me for twenty-four hours. Last time I took a dog home to Atlanta, you know, because we do train dogs from all over the country, I did a five-hour follow-up, you know, then drove four hours back home in Atlanta traffic. Good to go. Got Should have got a hotel. Got some Chick-fil-A, actually. They can't, they can't Don't they, they have, have a cheesecake factory down there? They do. Wow. I totally forgot about that. They got a Reese's You just waste, you wasted that's a really trip. Good. Well, you were so hell-bent on not staying down there. You know, yeah, like, yeah, I'm yeah. not staying the night. Yeah, I'm not staying the night. I got to come back to the HQ. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, might be time for another follow-up and then uh you know the last time i trained a dog from north carolina went up there that was a six hour return Whew. and they took me out for some pizza after oh yeah you know? that's <laughs> the way to chad's heart right there <laughs> that was a high value reward there yeah then i was fighting traffic getting all the way that was a four <laughs> hours back too <laughs> falling asleep because of the pizza <laughs> that pizza was that was some good pizza anyway shout out to our clients that are all over the country doing doing what they do you know we talk to these people regularly and they're doing great work with their dogs um so if you guys are listening appreciate your support um but that return session is critical you know what i'm saying to help that owner sync with their dog initially and start that transition period and then for us after the return we have a number of follow-up sessions usually the first one's going to be within a week because we know that your dog has a reinforcement history at your house you as the owner are getting used to and adjusted to your dog with these new training protocols at your house so it can be a little bit overwhelming so we come back make sure everything's good to go tune in anything and then your follow-ups after that we can just continue to tune in behaviors make sure everything is good to go so that from a to z is our training progression right um, and again this may be ju- adjusted a little bit for each dog that's that's coming in for you with your own dog you may use certain pieces of this you may not use certain pieces of this right and then if you're doing any type of specialized work specialized rehabilitation right insecurity anxiety aggression dominance right you may have to add steps to this remove steps from this uh things like that you know then if you're doing specialized work like you know protection sports or service dog work or emotional support animal or therapy work anything outside the normal realm of like obedient dog stuff that's going to take different progressions to get from a to z you know what i'm saying so whatever you're working on with your dog have your goal in mind figure out what your goal is have it in mind and then build a progression that's going to get you from point A to point B, teaching your dog in an appropriate, systematic way how to achieve your goal. Does that make sense? Good to go. All right. Well, we appreciate all you guys. Appreciate uh, the listeners out there. Thank you for your support. Feel free to drop us some comments if you're watching this on YouTube or on one of our social medias. Let us know how we're doing. Let us know what you want to see in a podcast. Let us know if you got some value out of this. And we do ask for... uh, You to rate us on your favorite podcasting platform. Give us a five-star review. Let us know how good we're doing. Let us know what you want to hear in the future, right? And also feel free to reach out to us via email, text, social media, whatever your preferred method of communication is so that uh, we can help you achieve your goals with your dog, right? And go, uh, you know, to to the level that you want to be at with them, right? And we do service the entire country. We've even, we've even done dogs internationally. So it's not an issue where your location is, um, just some details that have to be worked out. Okay, but hit us up, let us know. We appreciate your support. And until next time.